each artist should be allowed to pursue the artistic endeavor. But I still think there a lot of stuff that's on today is coonery and buffoonery. If those films, and I mean, we're, we're talking about Tyler Perry at this point. <laughs> no. Punch the hell out of you. Say something else. That is my answer to Spike Lee. Go to hell. Let me just let me just say this about Spike or anybody else, or all the critics, anybody else. You know. It's only black people that do this to each other. It's undeniable that Tyler Perry has made significant contributions to black cinema and his community. But lately, his name keeps popping up in the media for some pretty unexpected reasons, leaving people scratching their heads. Despite his talent and positive impact, there have been numerous instances where industry insiders have called him out for various reasons. Only for Tyler Perry to admit he did start a rumor that I was difficult to work with. He lied. Now, it seems Spike Lee might be adding his voice to the mix, hinting at some new disturbing details about Tyler Perry that he's eager to share with the world. This isn't the first time Spike has spoken up about Tyler, and fans are saying it's about time he chimed in again, especially considering his history of not holding back when it comes to criticizing Perry. It looks like we're in for another dose of hot tea from Spike Lee. So, what exactly could these supposed disturbing details be? Let's dive in. Now, despite walking similar paths in their careers, it's no secret that Spike Lee and Tyler Perry haven't always seen eye to eye. They did not like each other at all. Both heavyweights in their respective fields, they've each delivered a slew of impactful films, shining a spotlight on black culture. But what really caught fans off guard was the decade-long rift between them. Let's do a quick rundown. It all kicked off back in 2009 when Lee, who is known for his bold opinions, didn't hold back, taking aim at Perry's films and shows, dubbing them as representative of coonery and buffoon within the black community. In an interview with Black Enterprise, Spike Lee didn't sugarcoat it, linking Perry to artists who perpetuate stereotypical images on what he bluntly referred to as the idiot box. And I know it's making a lot of money, breaking records, but we could do better. A lot of this is on us. You know, we, you vote with your pocketbook, your wallet, you vote with uh, your time, sit in front of the, the idiot box. While he gave props to Perry for being savvy and knowing how to pull in a crowd, I mean, let's face it, Perry's got a massive fan base, and he's no dummy when it comes to making content that people eat up. But here's the thing, Spike wasn't exactly thrilled with the image Perry's movies and shows were putting out there about African Americans. He kind of called him out for pandering to what would get big ratings, even if it meant reinforcing stereotypes. Spike, on the other hand, was all about making movies that celebrated black culture without falling into those tired old tropes. Sure, maybe Maybe his stuff didn't always rake in the big bucks at the box office, but he was proud of the stories he told. To him, it was all about giving love and respect to his community through his art. Now Tyler Perry didn't hold back and he fired back at Spike Lee. It was 2009 and Perry was on 60 Minutes when they asked him about Spike's criticism of his work, and Perry didn't mince words. He straight up said he was sick and tired of hearing about Spike Lee, like really sick of it. He even went as far as saying Spike could go straight to hell. I will punch the hell out of you, say something else. That is my answer to Spike Lee, go to hell. Perry wasn't having any of Spike's critiques, especially when it came to being called out for coonery and buffoonery. He basically told Spike to zip it and stop talking smack about him and other big names like OPR and Clint Eastwood. I'm so sick of hearing about damn Spike Lee, he replied. Spike can go straight to hell. You can print that. I am sick of him talking about me. I am sick of him saying, this is a coon, this is a buffoon, he declared. He talked about Whoopi, he talked about OPR, he talked about me, he talked about Clint Eastwood, Spike needs to shut the hell up. Even though Tyler Perry clapped back at Spike, fans are chiming in and saying Spike might have a point after all. Even folks in the industry are talking about it. They're saying Tyler's casting and the way he portrays characters can sometimes lean into stereotypes pretty hard. Take Chris Rock, for example. He pointed out a pattern in Perry's movies. Rock noticed there's not a whole lot of kind and respectful black-skinned boyfriends in Perry's films. To drive his point home, he brought up Tupac Shakur, saying Perry's films could use a bit more variety in character representation. He said, Tupac might be a political leader if he was alive, but then again, Tupac might be in a Tyler Perry movie right now, so you don't know. He might be. 
Tupac might be the bad, dark-skinned boyfriend in the Tyler Perry movie. So, Chris Rock's deal was this. He's saying Tupac, who was a big deal in his rap days, might not score a hero role if he landed a spot in a Tyler Perry flick. Rock figures, based on Perry's usual casting moves, the chances of Tupac getting cast as a hero would be pretty slim. Just Rock sharing his thoughts on how things roll in the Tyler Perry movie universe. He further went on saying, I would hope he's a senator, but he might be kicking Jill Scott down a flight of stairs. Cultural critic Jamila Lemieux also chimed in, writing an open letter to Tyler Perry, and NPR published it. Lemieux straight up told Perry she wasn't vibing with how he used stereotypes in his work. She said through her, the country has laughed at one of the most important members of the black community, Mother Deer, the beloved matriarch. I just can't quite get with seeing Mother Deer played by a six-foot-three man with prosthetic breasts flopping in the wind. Our mothers and grandmothers deserve much more than that. Heck, our fathers and grandfathers deserve more. Mr. Perry, you have told the Hollywood old guard to kiss your backside, and I appreciate that, brother, but many black folks have expressed some of the very same attitudes about your work that white critics have. So, these three are on the same page, pointing out that Tyler Perry's casting and storytelling choices might be playing a part in certain movies' success. Thanks to some biases, they're questioning how this mindset could be messing with the film industry. And you know what? This colorism thing isn't exactly a stranger to Hollywood. Lately, Hollywood's been under fire with media campaigns and hashtags spreading like wildfire, shining a light on some pretty shady stuff. Remember Harvey Weinstein? Yeah, he was one of the first big shots to drag the industry into the negative spotlight with abuse allegations in 2017. Now, there's even a new documentary spilling the tea on the dark side of Hollywood, exposing power players allegedly preying on aspiring actors. Fast forward to the hash Me Too movement, and Hollywood's hit with scandals left and right. Kevin Hart stepped down as the Oscars host in 2019 over past homophobic tweets, and the hash Oscars So White campaign is calling for more diversity and recognition for people of color and marginalized communities. So, Hollywood's reputation has been significantly tarnished, and the Hollywood's glittering walk of fame? More like a lackluster stroll of shame without those stars. Let's flash back to a February afternoon in 1940s America, when actress Hattie McDaniel rocked the house by snagging the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress in Gone with the Wind. It was a historic win, making her the first African American to bag this prestigious film award. Sounds like a party, right? Well, not really. She would be segregated from the rest of the attendees at an Oscar ceremony that effectively operated as a whites-only event. Instead of being a celebration, this event was marked more by segregation. Despite the victory, the Oscars back then operated like a whites-only gig, and McDaniel found herself segregated from the rest of the crowd. Instead of pure celebration, it was more about segregation than jubilation. Fast forward 80 years, and guess what? Hollywood's still wrestling with discrimination, even though there's been some talk about boosting diversity. The 2020 Oscars? Oh, they weren't immune to racial controversies that both viewers and industry insiders have gotten pretty used to. And let's not forget the major snubs, like leaving out Lupita Nyong'o for her killer performance in the 2019 film Us. Now let's shift gears to Tyler Perry's realm of movies and shows. No hiding the fact that black-skinned actors are often cast as the villains in his flicks. Take Steve Harris in one of Perry's classics, Diary of a Mad Black Woman. He's playing Charles McCarter, a successful lawyer who turns out to be far from the ideal hubby. Shockingly, he drops the bomb on his wife about another woman in his life and then proceeds to treat her like dirt, eventually kicking her out. And then there's Blair Underwood, known for his stint in L.A. Law and rocking Hollywood for over over four decades. He spilled some tea about his early career and a run-in with the legendary Sidney Poitier. Back in the 80s, seeing black faces on screen was like finding a needle in a haystack, and when they did pop up, the roles were pretty limited and full of stereotypes, not giving much variety for black TV viewers. Blair Underwood knows the struggle firsthand. He and Denzel Washington were like the poster guys for black male representation on TV, and in movies at that time, getting props for their work. But guess what? Hollywood was still stuck in the same rut in the 90s. According to Underwood, every black actor and actress in Hollywood, no matter how known or skilled, were all hustling to audition for the same roles. Same old challenges, just a different decade. And in film during that era, receiving praise and recognition for their work. At least four black women in the hood. And speaking of roles, got his shot at playing a villain in Tyler's movies. He had a recurring gig in the first and second seasons of a show, rocking the part of a 
dealer. Ion Overman also took a turn as a not-so-nice character in Tyler's Medea Goes to Jail as Linda Davis, an envious assistant district attorney with a secret life of fraud and evidence tampering. Then there's Ron Rico Lee who portrayed Chuck, an assistant district attorney and Joshua's friend, and who could forget Brian White snagging a villain role in Tyler Perry's I Can Do Bad All By Myself as Randy, the abusive boyfriend and all-around antagonist. If you've been tuning into Tyler's movies and shows, you might have noticed a trend a lot of the not-so-nice characters tend to be really abusive towards women. It's a concerning thing that's got people raising their voices. Take his show Bruh, for example. It's all about four black dudes navigating life, dealing with relationships, friendships, and careers. They're like a tight-knit family, showing off those big smiles. Now, Sistas takes a different angle, focusing on the lives of four single black women. The tagline, single but never solo, hints at exploring their singlehood journey with all its ups and downs. But here's the kicker. The show seems to keep it more individual, with separate pics of the women instead of them together. The common thread? They're all rocking the single life, and the series might dive into their dating adventures and more. Another Tyler Perry's movie, A Fall from Grace, where Crystal Fox plays Grace Waters. She's been through the ringer with her ex-husband's affair and decides to take another shot at love with Maycod Brooks. But surprise, surprise, as she gets closer to him, she uncovers some seriously dark secrets. Grace's journey takes a twisted turn into love, betrayal, and the aftermath of people's choices. Now, Tyler Perry's movies like Acrimony always stir up discussions on Twitter and other social platforms. Some folks call out Perry for repeatedly showing the struggles of black women dealing with men's actions in his films. On the flip side, others say he's just shedding light on real-life issues that many black women can relate to. Now, let's talk about the Medea style of comedy. It's hilarious, no doubt, but some folks say there's more to it. Dave Chappelle on Oprah's show threw out a question. Why do we see so many black actors creating and playing female characters? When I see that they put every black man in the movies in a dress at some point in their career, I'll be connecting them down. Like, why all these brothers have to wear a dress? Chappelle had this experience while filming a movie with Martin Lawrence. He walks into the trailer and sees a dress, thinking it's the wrong one. Turns out it's for a scene where Martin's character sneaks out of jail by dressing Chappelle as a Chappelle's like, nah, I'm not doing that. It wasn't in the discussion. They try to pressure him, saying it's a hilarious bit, but he stands his ground, saying he doesn't need a dress to be funny. The whole thing gets intense with writers, directors, and producers pushing, but Chappelle sticks to his guns. In the end, they come up with a new scene without the dress, and he's left wondering, how did you write that so fast? Dave just didn't vibe with it, not because wearing a dress is an issue on its own, but because he felt the industry was trying to corner black artists into doing whatever it took for success. They kept hounding him, him until they figured out he wouldn't budge. Dave revealed this whole experience was an eye-opener. It took being told to wear a dress for him to connect the dots and realize this wasn't just his struggle. Lots of other black men had been asked to do the same. Martin Lawrence rocked it in Big Mama's house, Eddie Murphy pulled it off in the Nutty Professor series, and Jamie Foxx left a mark with his unforgettable ugly Wanda on In Living Color. Then you've got the Wyans brothers trying their hand at it with white chicks. Oh, and we can't forget the less successful Juana man. Yeah, some would rather forget that one. In the mix of all this, Tyler Perry takes the cake. He's not just known for his entertainment game, but has major influence, even in right-wing evangelical circles. His Medea franchise? Talk about significant success and acclaim in the entertainment world. Kevin Hart chimed in, saying artists need to protect their brand and not cross certain boundaries. He shared that up to that point, he hadn't faced any challenges to his personal beliefs. When asked if he ever ran into the whole wearing a dress scenario, Kevin was like, nope, haven't faced that dress dilemma. Gotta have boundaries and limits. He emphasized emphasize the importance of knowing you're a brand and protecting it at all times. Kevin mentioned turning down a request to dribble a basketball on a talk show because it would make him look foolish. His nine-year-old Oscar nominee, <laughs> Kevin But here's the twist. Just a year later, Kevin ended up on an SNL skit wearing a dress. Fans weren't having it and accused him of being a sellout and fake. So now people are wondering, why did Kevin Hart end up in the hot seat? Well, it seems like it was just his turn to go through the Hollywood rite of passage. See, the whole wearing a dress thing isn't unique to Kevin. Kevin. It's like a tradition that many male celebs before him have gone through. It's part of a bigger conspiracy, or at least that's what some folks believe. So, Tyler Perry fired back at Dave Chappelle in an interview, saying, Look, Chappelle is one of the smartest guys I've ever seen, not just in comedy, but in deep thinking. If that's how it rolls in Hollywood, cool, but that ain't my story. Nobody told me to wear that dress but me. It's my $2 billion franchise, and it's always been my choice. I've done 19 movies since then, all by my own call. Maybe it's different for others, but for me, it's like, 
like putting on a work uniform. I'm not a guy who enjoys wearing a dress, but as an actor, it's a costume. It's like someone going to Walmart, you put on your uniform. For me, it's about putting on that uniform, going out, making people laugh, lifting them up and giving them some encouragement. That's how I see it. That's not my case, right? Uh, I didn't, I didn't, I, nobody owned that dress. Right. But me. That's right. Nobody told me, a $2 billion franchise. Uh, nobody told me to put it on. That's right. Nobody makes me put it on. Now, besides all of this, there's also word on the street is that despite being a black entrepreneur himself, Tyler might not be as supportive of his fellow black creatives as he likes to make out. Sure, he's built studios and talked a big game about uplifting the black community, but some folks are saying it's all smoke and mirrors. Take Monique, for instance. She's been shouting from the rooftops about Tyler's alleged mistreatment towards her for what feels like forever. The drama started way back in 2009 when Monique starred in Precious, a movie produced by OPR and Tyler Perry and directed by Lee Daniels. The real beef kicked off when OPR and Tyler decided Monique should hit the press circuit for the film without any paycheck. Monique wasn't having it and straight up said, nah, not in my contract. According to Monique, she only got a measly 50k for the whole movie, which was barely enough. Now they wanted her to jet around the world promoting the film for free? Not on Monique's watch. But OPR and Tyler didn't take her refusal well at all. Instead, they started trashing her reputation in the industry, spinning a narrative about her being difficult to work with. Monique spilled the tea, saying Tyler Perry told her, You may want to consider promoting this film because if you get nominated for an Oscar, your next film is three to five million dollars. And if you win it, your next film is six to eight million dollars. Monique was like, hold up, I'm a black woman. Where are they paying those salaries, brother? She straight up told Tyler, I can't work for free. I've done what I was supposed to do. I can't go overseas and do this for free. Their back and forth continued, with Tyler saying he doesn't believe in giving money away for free. And Monique firing back, I don't believe in working for free. So we on the same page? It's a classic case of clash in values. And Monique wasn't backing down. He says, well, I don't believe in giving money away for free. I said, I don't believe in working for free, so we're on the same page. She also claimed Tyler Perry allegedly went the extra mile to mess with her acting gig. According to Monique, it all went down after she turned down a request to fly to France for the Cannes Film Festival, tied to promoting the movie Precious. So, check it. The movie studio initially asked her to jet off to France, but Monique, with her busy schedule as a talk show host, comedian, and family woman, respectfully declined. They tried to sweeten the deal by offering to upgrade her hotel room, but she and her husband stuck to their guns saying, nah, we're gonna spend this time with our family. She said, OPR, I'm doing a talk show, I'm doing a comedy tour, I have a husband and I have babies, I have a little bit of downtime and I am going to take advantage of it. So I'm not going anywhere because I'm not obligated to go anywhere. I've done my part. So we mutually agreed to disagree. That was it. Next thing I know, I am considered difficult and hard to work with. When the third call came and they asked, what's it gonna take to get Monique to France? Her husband straight up asked, is there a number associated with it? That's when they dropped the bomb that they would never pay for anyone to do promotions for a movie. Monique revealed she was paid a mere $50,000 for Precious, and it wasn't about the money, she signed up to do it with her friend. The interviewer dug in, suggesting she needed the money to feed her family and pay bills, and Monique responded, I think that's what America says. We all say, I can't do it for free. She explained that when the movie studio refused to pay for her Cannes appearance, they didn't make a fuss. But then the report started flying, painting Monique as demanding and difficult. The whole thing boiled down to a simple request that they understood couldn't be met. But suddenly, Monique found herself labeled, and that's where the drama kicked in. Good, because what people didn't know was, I was paid $50,000 to do the movie Precious. And it really wasn't about the money, and I'm not complaining because I signed up to do it with my friend. Media stories start popping up, painting Monique as difficult to work with. Suddenly, no one wanted to cast her, despite her winning an Oscar for her role in Precious. Imagine seeing all your hard work go down the drain. Monique started putting two and two together, realizing someone was out to get her. In a recent chat with The Hollywood Reporter, she spilled the beans that Precious director Lee Daniels admitted she got blackballed for not playing the game. Monique's even called out OPR and Tyler Perry, asking for for an apology that, as far as we know, is still MIA. But Monique wasn't done dropping bombs just yet. She went on to spill the tea about how Tyler Perry cost her and her family tens of millions of dollars over a rumor he started about her. She recounted the whole situation, saying that Tyler told her he'd never do anything to hurt her, but then later admitted to starting a false rumor that she was difficult to work with. Monique didn't hold back, expressing her frustration and disappointment, especially after Tyler's initial denial. She went on to talk about how during her conversation with Shannon, she 
referenced an interview he did with Kat, where he admitted to letting people lie in his face, because he didn't know if they were lying or not. Monique made it clear that she wanted Shannon to hear Tyler's own words, so she sent him the audio recording of their conversation. And let me tell you, it wasn't a walk in the park. Monique revealed that she recorded the conversation legally, which she emphasized was crucial for her as a black woman facing off against someone as powerful as Tyler Perry. She explained that having the audio proof was a game changer, as it prevented her from being dismissed or ignored. Had I not recorded Tyler Perry, then it would have been my word, word against, his. against his. And then on top of that, it would have been, he's so powerful, we can't even pay no attention to that. Monique didn't mince words about the impact of Tyler's actions on her and her family. She stressed that the lie Tyler spread cost them a staggering amount of money, leaving them in a tough spot financially. It was a tough pill to swallow, and Monique didn't hesitate to share the weight of the consequences of Tyler's actions. You know what's illegal to... But did you hear what the man said? I, I violated you. Yeah. I mistreated you. Yeah. Do you know, Shannon, that's cost my family tens of millions of dollars? Yeah. And let's not forget about that time Tyler Perry reportedly let go of a bunch of writers because he wasn't willing to cough up what they deserved. So after killing it at the box office, Tyler Perry made his way to TV with the hit sitcom House of Pain. But when it came to scoring a sweet syndication deal and a spinoff named Meet the Browns, things got messy. According to Deadline, Perry gave the boot to four writers asking for union contracts, stirring up drama in the industry. It was not a good look. I feel like I was slapped in the face like we were used, writer Terry Brown Jackson told Deadline. We were good enough to create over a hundred episodes, but now when it comes to reaping the benefits of the show being syndicated and having other spin-offs from it, he decides to let us go unless we accept a horrible offer. Kelly Griffin, the head writer for House of Pain, said she wasn't going down without a fight. While I'd like to see something positive come out of this for us, if this fight helps future black writers get what they deserve, that's a good thing. But what was Perry's response? He claimed he's writing everything himself now. But his union issues didn't stop there. In 2015, actor unions SAG-AFTRA and Actors' Equity went all in, banning their members from Perry's play Medea on the Run because his production company wouldn't sign those union contracts. Looks like Perry's profit game isn't winning cheers from everyone in the business. But I want to know what you guys think of all this. Write your thoughts in the comment below, and we'll catch you in the next video.